Vancouver is well known for its diversity. Diversity in its scenery, recreation, art, and cuisine. I'm Katrina Cotton, and welcome to Indie Corner BC, where we search out and showcase inspiring stories from seemingly average BC residents who have struck out on their own to create their own destiny and success. as we take you on a cultural and scenic tour of Vancouver with today's emphasis on Vancouver's coffee culture. <music> European cities like Vienna, Milan and Naples, all cities known for centuries for their great coffee as well as their contributions to the Western coffee culture and its rich history. One could argue that in more recent times that North American cities like Seattle, San Francisco and our great Canadian city of Vancouver have also made great contributions to coffee and coffee culture. Today, we aim to visit part of the backbone of the Vancouver coffee bean scene and highlight some indie coffee entrepreneurs operating right here in beautiful Vancouver, BC. Self-made business owners who are committed to ensuring that their loyal customers are not only getting their delicious caffeine fix to help assist them throughout the day, but they are going the extra mile to provide a welcoming space so that they can enjoy their favorite cup of joe with some delectable accompaniment. Now, a moment ago, you heard me mention Europe as a major influencer on coffee and coffee culture. For centuries, Europeans have long been known for their dedication to coffee excellence. So, with that, you gotta wonder, how did Europeans get their hands on coffee so many centuries ago? Especially that there's nowhere in Europe that coffee plants even grow. To answer that question, let's go to our technical consultant on coffee and show producer, Dean, as he takes you on a short but fun history lesson on the origins of the history of coffee. Well, I do a little bit of tasting and shopping here at the Granville Public Market. Thanks, Katrina. Enjoy the public market. As Katrina said, I am the technical consultant for this production. I've spent more than 20 years in the coffee industry and it has been one of my passions. But more about my coffee credentials later. Right now we thought we would offer our coffee enthusiasts out there some fun-filled facts about the history and origins of coffee. Now, while no one really knows the exact date or place where coffee was discovered, there is a widely accepted legend that narrows the discovery of coffee down to a general historical period and geographical region where the incredible journey of the beloved coffee bean all began. I brought my magic whiteboard here to help me tell the tale. Coffee historians have deduced that the origins of coffee as a beverage can be traced back to roughly 850 AD back to Ethiopia. Enter the legend of Kali and his dancing goats. There are variations of this story, but legend has it 
an Ethiopian goat herder named Kaldi witnessed his goats eating cherries from a coffee plant. Kaldi saw that after his goats ingested the cherries that the animals seemed to be full of energy. So much energy they appeared to be dancing. He decided to also consume a few of the cherries and noticed that he too felt energized by them. Kaldi, he took these cherries and he brought them back to a Sufi monastery near his home and shared both the cherries and the story of what he witnessed with a monk. Over time, the monk and the rest of the monastery discovered that there was indeed a stimulating and energizing effect when you ingest these cherries. Eventually, they figured out that much of the stimulating effect was contained in the pit of the cherry. Then they discovered that if you dry the pits out and then roast them over a fire, that it created a much more aromatic and flavorful pit, also known as coffee bean, which offered concentrated effects of the coffee bean compared to the flesh of the cherry. And that while chewing these coffee beans whole, while possible, and even enjoyable by some, that it was quite bitter for most people. To tame the bitterness, they found that if you crush the roasted pits into a powder and steep the coffee grinds in hot water, that you can make an extraction beverage similar to tea. And that not only was the stimulating effect still present, but much more pleasant to consume. It took time, but as years and decades and centuries passed, the Muslim community embraced the hot beverage, which became a regular part of the Ottoman social culture. A much less sophisticated version than that of the coffee we all have come to know and love today eventually spread across the Ottoman Empire. And so it was that the first coffee beverage, along with the first version of coffee culture, was born. We'll return to Petard, Boulangerie, a little later. But for now, Katrina, it's back to you. Wow, Dean, thanks. Great story. And where'd you learn to draw so fast? We've obviously come a long way since the 1800s and the first ever espresso. So let's go out and see how far we've come from those days and try some modern espresso. We are off to our first stop. Let's go. So we're here at this indie corner of BC at Main and 20th in the heart of Mount Pleasant a dynamic and popular neighborhood. Foglifter Coffee Roasters, a recently opened business owned and operated by Wayne and Amanda Nicoletti. So, as I was saying, despite the recent opening, many customers have been coming here for years. I see Dean has already beat me to it, and I can only assume that's Amanda. Let's head in. that far away and no matter how far I am, a little movie magic, I'll always beat you here. I'm so glad you made it. And uh, so Amanda, this is Katrina. Katrina, Hi, this nice is Amanda. To meet you. Nice to meet you. Just join us. We're, we were just talking about the old days. Yes. So Amanda, I know that you, Wayne, and Dean go way back. I do. And you both cut your teeth in the same coffee chain being around the world, is it? Yeah, that's right. We were all in the chain over in West Bend at one point. Nice. And uh, in 2001, my husband Wayne opened up a Bean Around the World in this location. Yeah. And we were here for 16 years. So yeah, we do go way back. I got the old anniversary hat on. There you go. Love it. 1990 Bean. Well, Amanda, I would love to hear more about how you leaped into the coffee scene and became independent at roasting your own coffee. But first, I definitely need to try a coffee and maybe one or two of your delicious treats. So <laughs> what? Why don't I get that? So I've been meaning to ask you this. I think I got it figured out. Fog lifter has a lot to do with your first morning coffee to lift yeah. that fog. But, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing there's a second uh, meaning to that. Yeah, double a bit meaning. of a double entendre. Overlooking Seanigan Lake, there's often a fog over the lake in the morning, and pretty much every day we kind of see, watch it lift and uh, get going on the day with our coffee. So we wanted to evoke that sense of place where the roastery is and bring a bit of Vancouver Island to East Bend. I love the name, actually. Thanks. I do. Where did the name Eight Man come from? 
Um, well, we, as you know from our logo, we um, have some rowing imagery as part of our kind of branding. Our roastery overlooks Shawnigan Lake on the island, and there's a rowing team there, so that was always part of sort of our livelihood. And so we in introduced the rower into the logo, and the eight-man rowing boat is like the full horsepower, heavy-duty boat. And so we thought that was a good fitting name for our, you know, Nice. Strong espresso. It's all over your logo there, so. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Right? So that's yeah. that's the lonely single man, and the and when you need a, a lot of horsepower, you go with the eight man. Well, there's a lot of rowers in this city, so I'm, yeah. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. There's a lot that. of rowers everywhere. I'm finding. Yeah, out. yeah right. You have several other beans that you roast, or. Yeah, yeah. We try to do a mix of coffees that are available year round, and then seasonal coffees that come along as the seasons evolve around the globe. So right now we have Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, and then soon we'll get some coffees from Ethiopia and just sort of changes throughout the year. But we also have a stable um, few coffees from Peru, from Guatemala, Sumatra that are always available. I've seen on your website, it seems like you're very community oriented. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we, we try to be. I mean, uh, as I was saying, uh, between being located within a community and a bit of a community hub, we try to carry on that same sort of neighborly intention um, right through to the baking and the coffee program. And, and you have relationships with a lot of these producers. Yeah, yeah, we do. We try to get as close to the producers of the coffee as we can. So we like to try to work with family-owned farms or cooperatives or somebody and, and keep the same coffee year after year so that there's a bit of a relationship that develops and we want to try to know the grower as much as possible. Like with the Santa Clara coffee, we've been working um, with Ricardo Zelaya since 2007 and being around the world. And that's a very ideal relationship and you're not really going to be able to duplicate that very much. Just as much as we can communicate directly with the people that are producing our coffee or we're partnering with, I guess you would say, we just feel better about that. It allows you to know who you're working with and then maybe do things that go beyond just buying coffee and selling coffee. You have mm. some great stories yeah. from the producers that yeah. you do work with. It's the nice thing about having uh, that relationship is you can find ways to be productive and meet and create some sort of different stream of meaningfulness. With the Zelayas, a good example is they've created the Santa Clara Scholarship Fund in Antigua to help finance the education of some of their employees. And um, there's different ways you can take part in it. What we do is we sponsor five um, students, and they range from kindergarten to university level. In fact, the, our oldest student just graduated from university. He was the first person in the program. So these are, it's just an opportunity for us to give back to where our products have come from. And it gives them an opportunity that they just wouldn't otherwise have. I mean, it's not, it's a meaningful education and it's beyond their reach for the most part. So Ricardo has been able to find partners to help um, his community and we're really glad to be a part of that. You're looking for people that have that kind of initiative and creativity and sense of community and want to elevate. Like that's I think something we talk about among, among our team a lot is elevating. Like you can choose to buy a coffee that does nothing or you can choose to buy a coffee that is having an impact for, for everyone here it, at Origin, everywhere along the way and so that's just what we try to do. For example, like the coffee that we have from Mexico, I mean this is just one woman's um, initiative in her community. She noticed there were a lot of female producers but they were missing the capacity to access infrastructure so she is basically become the exporter for this group of women. And um, that, that's the only way that this coffee gets here, right? These wow. in small producers with a five acre plot in Chiapas, like they don't have the capacity to export their coffee into the international market. So Mandy, you opened what? We opened about seven or eight weeks ago, okay. mid, mid June. We took possession of this space about a year ago, and to be honest, like there's always delays. The pandemic made for a little bit slower timeline in permitting and dealing with City Hall because they were all working from home. But generally speaking, I mean, it didn't really impact us. We had paper over the windows, our trades were all here, and we just plugged away building, and, um, and then we were ready to go, kind of in the nick of time. 
And, and during that time, did you did, was it you working on your roasting skills? I'm or? always working on my roasting skills. Yeah, I, we we roast a lot, like, um, and that's what I've basically been doing full time since 2017. I mean, we literally wanted to roast. We bought the roaster. It was shipped from Idaho. They're made to order. Arrived at Shawnigan, and we just went for it. You just have to roast. It's well, like anything. You got to do it and keep doing it, making coffee, and just keep trying to get better. Well, everything I've tasted so far, you've been at this a long time. Thanks. Yeah, well, I really, do really it a good. lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's no, it's true. It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Maybe with your permission, at some point we can bring our crew over and our cameras, yeah. and you know, maybe get some footage of yeah. you in action. Yeah, that'd be cool. Like, we've been trying to bring some of the things we love most about the Cowichan Valley with us here to East Van. You notice it if you've been there. So Amanda, I just I just want to say thank you for uh, taking time out. This place is yeah. rocking busy. So yeah, thanks I, uh, for squeezing us in. Yeah, no, thank you for squeezing us yeah. in because uh, I know you're really busy and taking some time just to sit down and uh, tell yeah, us your no. story. That was a great example of a North American coffee house along with a North American style roast. A great place to relax with your friends, work on your laptop, or read a book. Now, the next stop we're gonna take you is on the other side of the coffee spectrum, Mello Patisserie. It's got a little bit of a European feel, but I'm excited to show you guys. Let's go. Welcome to Mellow Patisserie, located on 8th and Main. We were fortunate to get Chef Mellow's time to ask him a few questions on what it took to open this business. Hi, Chef Mellow! I'm Katrina. It's such a pleasure to meet you, and this is such a beautiful place. Do you have a moment? I would love to hear your story. Yes, welcome, Katrina. Yes, I would like to talk to you. Let's go talk. Okay. Thank you. This is such an amazing, beautiful place. I know that there was a success in the opening, but there were some challenges as well. Would you mind sharing a bit of that story with us? Yes, of course. I can tell about what's happened before and how I make my dreams come true. Well, I am from Brazil. I just moved to Canada to get a better life. And I soon arrived here. It's my first job as a dishwasher in a bakery. The first months I have to find out what I want to do for my life and education has always opened the door. So I heard about Vancouver Community College. When I find out they have a baking school program, and I'll say, okay, I'm working in a bakery, I had fun, I like it, so I want to apply for the program. At that time I was washing dishes in, in evenings, and I have a morning and afternoon spent at the Vancouver Community College. I say, okay, I, I can do this. And another thing, I have a, I have a gift. I got inspired. And I have one chef, and she's, she's from Europe, and she said, you should go to France because it's the best place in the world to learn French pastries. It's a classic school. You should go to France. Finished my graduation at Vancouver Community College. I was a top student from the class. So I'm looking for information for a school. Le Cordon Bleu has a very good reputation. Wow, top of your class at VCC, and then Le Cordon Bleu? And I want to go to France. And I start working two jobs, three jobs, seven days a week. <laughs> because we have to save money for school, accommodation, transportation, as food for one year. I don't have enough money, but I got a business loan for the bank. So I moved to France in May 2013. Sounds like a very big challenge. How did you get by? It was a big challenge, yes. But I believe challenge is part of my life. Uh, every time I have something to do, and I go and do it. When I start my school, the chefs, they notice I have a skill, I have talent. So I start working as a chef's assistant at school. This has helped a lot. I have opportunity to work with your chefs in that, that high level. Vancouver Community College, they gave me a good base. Uh, in France, was the final touch. So when you graduated from Le Cordon Bleu, where did you go next? Uh, because I decided after one year working there, I said I have to start to back to Canada and I have to see what's the next step. That time I find an opportunity to work in Singapore. 
new country, new language, because the Asians, they are working very fast, very efficient. It's another level. So at that time, I started building more information, more knowledge in how the Asians work, how the Europeans work, how the Canadians work, how the Brazilians work. And I put everything together. But I want to back to Vancouver because I like it. Vancouver is my home. But at that time, I said, OK, I can't open my own business. And that was the next step, saving money and open my business. There's a lot of steps to get there. I have to make a business plan, and they give me the business loan to open my business. It was 2019. Of course, I was doing my homework since a couple years ago. I was buying trays, I was buying uh, tools for kitchen. Every time I see like a, something on sale, I buy because I know one day I want to use it in my kitchen. So all of the equipment that you bought was stored in your living room? Because the dreams come like many years ago, and you start building slowly, slowly, slowly. It's a challenge to find a location in Vancouver. The rent is very expensive, but I saw one place it was neither renovation, but I have the feeling. I always have the feeling. This is a good spot. I went, I walk inside the place. I saw how, how bad it was, right? Need a big renovation. I signed the contract in October 2019. And that time I find out how expensive it is to do a renovation in Vancouver. It's like a, one electrician, they can charge you $25,000, $30,000. Wow, now I have a problem. I signed a contract and I need to do a renovation for a place that everything has to be renovated because over 30 years, nobody changed nothing. So I went to City Hall Vancouver. It's another challenge. Understand how to renovate a business place in Vancouver. So to save money, you became your own lead contractor? That's crazy. Did you have any experience at all? I have to understand the requirements. I have to hire people, drywall, electrician, plumber, everything. I have to understand how to do demolition. I check YouTube. <laughs> I check YouTube how to do it. That's amazing. YouTube? <laughs> I soon I get my building permit, end of February. We have March as a COVID. On top of the problem I have, the renovation. So when the pandemic first happened, did you ever have a thought in your mind thinking that you wouldn't open this place? That was scary. I didn't know what's happening to me. The money, I put everything I have in my savings. The world stopped. And my worry is, how can I go finish that renovation? How did you get by? Because it was my dreams. I, I cannot give up. I have to keep working. I have to, I have to, to make sure my dreams is alive. The world stop, but not me. It was very hard because everybody know in Vancouver to f do a renovation in normal days is very hard. In pandemic time, it's three times harder. And I say, okay, I have to open the shop because I'm out of money. How can I open the shop? I have only $40 in my bank account. Wow, $40 in your bank account? One week before I opened my business. It took 11 months to finish my renovation. I decided to open the business in August 1st, 2020. Five days before opening my shop, Hannah from Daily Hive, she texted me and she said, Melo, when do you want to open your shop? And I said, I will open August 1st. She said, can I spread the news? I said, yes. I believe it's the adrenaline. I don't know, I think it's the adrenaline that make you not stop. I call my friends to help me because by myself I cannot do everything. Three days before opening the shop, I didn't sleep. I have to work. Ever since, I, I, I didn't know how powerful it was my network to help me to open a business. That was my dream. That was my little dream. Without help from friends, they come here to help me. They come here to clean the windows. They come here to, to clean the washroom. I was in the kitchen just baking like a crazy. I don't know how can how can one person can stay three days without sleeping. The opening day, August first, the case display was beautiful. We have a lot of dessert. We have more than 150 people show up. It was beautiful. Uh, it was on Saturday. Saturday and Sunday, I have the money for my rent. I didn't have before. <laughs> so in two days, I have a sales that can pay my rent for one more month. 
So after two days, I, I realized, okay, I, I can survive, work 20 hours a day, sleep for hours. He started the kitchen. I, I call used to call people and say like, uh, okay, what are you doing on Saturday afternoon? <laughs> Nothing. Can you help me here in the kitchen? And the people say yes for me. This is good friends. And uh, slowly, I, I think after five, six weeks, I can hire the first one that I can pay. People come here and they like the place, they like the environment, they like the energy, they like the product, the quality. I heard this is almost every day. I trust you, do whatever you want. Everything you do is do good. Their presentation, the customer service. When I opened the shop the first time, I got the, the feeling. I did right. Everything I did from almost one year. I learned a lot, A to Z. I did right. Everything I did was right. So what next? Next step, maybe another second location. I want to look back and say, oh, I have a history in my life. And I want to give back. What a great way to end an amazing story with such a great chef and a wonderful place. Thank you again, Chef Mello. treats. Now we're on to the next stop. Let's go. Our last stop has the flair of Europe and the casual atmosphere like a North American coffee house. Let's check it out. Boulangerie and Bakery is a family-owned business, operating for the last six years. They just recently opened their in-house seating only after being able to provide takeout and delivery because of the pandemic. Trina. I'm Sasha. I got you a coffee. Oh, thank you. I love that this place is absolutely beautiful. I see you have refrigerated goods, breads, preserves, and a family artwork. I would love to hear more about the success of the tar. For sure. Let's go sit outside. Okay. Yeah, after you. I love the concept. And obviously, it's a hit with your customers. You and your family obviously take great pride in what you have created. While I was in Europe, Batard was beginning, and in the t meantime, it was my sister, Elsie, who was running the bakery here and doing most of the stuff. We had a temporary baker, but overall, this was still in the family. And my parents were always long rooted in Vancouver as chefs and restaurant owners. I would say probably plus 30 years in the industry. Uh, they opened a bunch of restaurants, one after the next, uh, and eventually they decided they were done with the restaurant industry and uh, decided to open up a bakery and acquired a farm up on Salt Spring Island. It's really something special because they grow amazing veggies and stuff. Over the last, I think it was two years ago, we ended up getting our commercial kitchen license for the farm. There's very little that's not done by us. And by us, I mean my family. Uh, it's a family deal in and out. Uh, we have conversations every week. What 
the tart originals can foodies look to try? So here we're definitely known for our croissant line. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, uh, myself personally, in France learning and perfecting different methods on lamination. It's the pain au chocolat, Queen Amand, and uh, we have a lot of other specialty little things like a jambon and fromage and kind of I constantly change them. I like to keep it seasonal. For coffee, we actually had a really tough time because uh, most of the coffee here I find is new age coffee, not European roasted or Italian roasted style. Uh, so that's when we came across Umbria. We really fell in love with uh, the Gusta Crema from Umbria. It's top of the line. So I think that's why also a lot of the customers love our spot is that it's almost like they say a piece of France or a little piece of Paris in Vancouver. And looking at your refrigerated section, baking is not the only thing created in-house. Be surprised what comes out of that little kitchen. Uh, it's a tiny little spot back there. There's only four of us and we're on a little rotation. And that's about it. Another specialty is we're always, as we're making all the soups in-house, we make a couple dips. So like from our hummus to French white bean dip. You have a great line of preserves straight off of the farm. What, in your mind, separates them most from other preserves that you would buy in a regular store? Yeah, generally speaking, with our um, grocery line and all this, we really focus from the farm how to make great jams and this, uh, all these very specialty jams. And what's very, I think, what separates the, our jams from the rest that you can go buy at the store is it not, it's low in sugar, it's high in fruit flavor. They're flying off the shelf. Uh, they are the, like, that's the best raspberry jam I ever had, okay? I have talked to a lot of business owners in this industry, and it is an incredible amount of work. Do you or did any of your mentors question your decision to get into this business? So most of my mentors would usually ask me, why would I want to spend the rest of my life baking bread in front of a 250 degree oven? Honestly, it took me just a, like, I would say a week, and I just knew I was gonna do it. I, I'm ready to rumble. If I had advice for probably any young entrepreneurs entering this industry, I would definitely say you gotta be dedicated. There's definitely has to be like some sense of urgency. I would say the passion has to be high and the belief behind your product. Do you have any plans for expansion or future locations? We're getting out of this pandemic right now. I have been on the hunt for another location. That's something exciting for myself. I noticed that we're quite busy here, so it's time. It's time to get it to the next level. It's the capacity, and I want to serve the customer better, you know? And that's uh, what we strive for as uh, entrepreneurs in this restaurant industry, is always to serve the customer better, or how can I serve the customer better? We hope you enjoyed Indie Corner BC and the Vancouver coffee bean scene, along with the history lesson on the origins of coffee. There is so much to cover about this beautiful city and everything it has to offer, from the scenery, to the cuisine, to the culture, and of course, the coffee. We hope to see you next time, but until then, enjoy Vancouver and its coffee.